Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever increasing world feast. I'm excited to welcome you, friends and family, right here on Facebook, YouTube, and all our social media handles. Abel Damina is my name. Listen, the truth of the word of God is, when God's word is preached and taught, God's power to save is made available. Brother Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I'm honored to serve you grace today, to bring you clarity of teaching from the word of God. Invite a friend, a loved one, create watch parties, tag people, because the word is gonna come very hot and powerful today. You know, there's a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. It is with that mandate in mind that this message is coming to you right now. It will change your life forever. However, remember the scripture tells us the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. The Greek word hugaino wholesome doctrine. There's an endurance required. So as you listen, please painstakingly and patiently listen to the teaching of God's word. Don't listen with a critical mind. Listen with a mind to learn. You know, Jesus said, learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest. So there's a meekness required. Brother James says, with meekness, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. There's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So you want to patiently follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series. So get ready to follow. And if there's anything you don't understand, be patient. The teachings will continue to explain themselves until you come to a place of understanding and clarity in the knowledge of Christ. One more thing to say with you today. If you're in an area where there's no Bible teaching church, where the message of Christ like this is preached, you can start one or you can join any of our campuses. Our campuses are extension houses of our local church where brethren come together and they are fed, they are taught, they take responsibility, they pray together, they reach out to the people in their community with the truth of God's word. Our campuses are lighthouses in nations and cities and communities where believers come together and they are taught the word of God by myself. And I'm excited if you want to be a part of what we're doing around your community or you want to start one. All you need to do is shoot me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we shall guide you on what to do to either begin one campus or join another. It's not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says, do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. In prophecy, the word of God tells us that God will bring the solitary into families. You are a member of a family and there is no family that does not have a gathering. Our gathering is our assemblage to be taught, to be equipped, and to become responsible for other people's growth. It's so important, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you today. Lastly, there's a plethora of books I have written that addresses so many issues of the Christian faith. They're all on the screen. Look at this. Today, you can order for a book or two or all the set by shooting an email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Including today's message, you can order for the CD or the DVD. The entire essence is to nourish you, enrich you, and equip you with robust understanding of your relationship with Almighty God. I'm excited to be able to serve you. Fasting your seatbelts. Let me take you right now into a gospel adventure, into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. We're looking at the book of Revelation or the revelation of Jesus, which is the theme of the book of Revelation. And I'm going to begin from where we have always read as our key scripture in this study. Revelation chapter 1 verse number 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the theme of the book. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So the revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And because the book is about Jesus Christ, it tallies with the message of the entire scriptures. 
John 5, 39. Jesus said to the Jews, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So the scriptures are the testimony of Jesus Christ. In the book of Luke chapter 24, verse 25, look at the way Jesus will put it to those guys on the way to Emmaus. He said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What have the prophets spoken? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Look at verse 44 of the same chapter. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. Thou things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Hence we say the Bible is a Christocentric material that carries with it a Christocentric message, a Christ-centered message. Look at the next verse, 45. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Verse 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus is behoof Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So the message of the scriptures is the message of a person. The scriptures testify of a person. The entire book is the book of Jesus. So revelation re reiterates that reality. It begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse number 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Verse 5. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. So the revelation of Jesus we are about to see is the revelation of the risen Lord. The first begotten. Not the incarnate Christ, but the first begotten or the firstborn from the dead. All right? The first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. Take note of the tenses. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So he first of all establishes the position of those churches and the believers in those churches on the finished work of Christ. He hath loved us sacrificial work. He has saved us you know a result of his resurrection. He has washed us and he hath made us kings and priests unto our God. Pay attention to the tenses. So first of all, he secures the salvation of the believers in those seven churches by reinforcing and by, by reminding them that they are loved, they are washed, and they are made kings and priests unto our God. Now, chapter 2, therefore, from verse 1, we've been dealing with the church at Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, this thing saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Take note of the word repent. We did some work on it in the previous service. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove the candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. To repent in one verse. But this thou hast. That thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Verse 7. He that an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we began to deal with the church at Ephesus. And if you remember, in the last service, this was where we stopped. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, that your labor in Christ will not be rewarded by vain things or material things. That's where we stopped. That the reward that Jesus will give us for our service and our ministry work it's not going to be reward that can be measured materially. It's not things that has to do with silver, gold, and houses, and cars, you know, and things. Uh -uh. The reward that Jesus is going to give us for ministry and for service, they are rewards that are intangible and immaterial. So it is not going to be measured by money or material stuff. That's why it says, for as much as you know, that your labor is not in vain, in vain things in the Lord. Remember, he told him in Ephesians chapter 2, I know your works, works, works. There's a difference between salvation and works. And in the last service, we concluded that the latest, therefore, to the seven churches were not latest that related to salvation. Rather, they were latest that related to their works and the reward of their works. And I'm going to break it down for you as we read on. Now, once you are saved and you begin to mature and you begin to serve, serving the Lord is seen by serving in and through his body. You serve in and you serve his body. Because one of the attributes of regeneration is that God's love is shed abroad in our heart for the brethren. We love the brethren. Therefore, we also, we lay down our lives for the brethren because we love the brethren. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, your faith and your love to the saints. If you pay attention, no apostle, not even Jesus, taught believers to expect material things as rewards for faithfulness in service. Jesus never taught that our reward is material. Rather, Jesus said, lay up for yourself treasures where thieves cannot break through and steal. Jesus admonished that the believer must be with eternity in view. The apostles taught, Paul taught, that our labor is not in vain things. Brother Peter will say, we are called to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away, reserved for us in heaven. So none of them insinuated that our reward for faithfulness in service will be immaterial stuff. And somebody said to me, but Jesus said, he that will forsake father, mother, brothers, and sisters for my sake and for the gospels in Matthew and Mark, he shall reap a hundredfold in this world and a hundredfold in the world to come. Is that not some reward in material stuff? Well, again, you must remember when Jesus gave that parable, first of all, it was a parable. When Jesus gave that parable, it had to do with leaving everything to follow him. Leaving everything to follow him. And they say, we have left everything to follow you. What shall we gain? And Jesus said, well, for the, for the purpose of missionary work, if you forsake father and mother, where you go to be a missionary, you will have father, mother, brothers and sisters. Just like I left and came to Aquaibom and I have all of you with me. So he was dealing with missionaries. He was not dealing with, you know, God's reward system. He was saying what you lose for the sake of the gospel, you will get in return in this world. It had nothing to do with giving money to get money. It had nothing to do with giving car to get car. He was dealing with service and ministry. Now, pay attention. What then is the reward? Since the reward we expect of the Lord for ministry, for service, for the things we go through for ministry, persecution, trials, and we have to persevere and keep advancing the message and keep advancing the cause in the midst of affliction and trials. What then will be our reward? Let's examine this reward. First Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 and I'm going to read till verse 15. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builded thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, 
every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be born, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now in verse 10 to 11, Brother Paul explains the foundation he laid as Christ Jesus. The foundation of any ministry that has a future has to be Christ Jesus. Because the message is Christ Jesus. The gospel is Christ Jesus. The revelation of the scriptures is Christ Jesus. The mystery is Christ Jesus. The types and the shadows are Christ Jesus. The prophecy and the promises of the Old Testament are all Christ Jesus. So any message that is not predicated on Christ and his finished work is not a sure foundation. For it to be a sure foundation that will stand the test of time, the message, the content of the message, and the context of the message must be the unveiling of Christ to reveal the believer in Christ. Now, what exactly was Brother Paul discussing in that verse of scripture? Let's go back to the pretext. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 to 9. Please pay attention to verse 5. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers. Ministers. So he's discussing ministry here. Ministers by whom you believed. Even as the Lord gave to every man. He's discussing ministers. He's not discussing salvation. All right? I have planted Apollos water, but God giveth the increase. So then, neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planted and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. His own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers, take note of the word laborers, together with God. You are God's husbandry, you are God's building. So here, he is discussing ministry. That's the pretext. He was discussing ministry. We are laborers together with God. Paul was discussing planting and watering as the work of the ministry. The building in verse 12, look at it. Now if any man build upon this foundation... That building there refers to a people. The building of believers. The building of a people. That means the minister and the servant of God is to build people. To build believers on the foundation already laid by the apostles, which is Christ Jesus. Every minister of the gospel has one primary assignment. To build believers on the already laid foundation. If you remember in the previous service, I said Christianity is an apostolic faith that is built on what has been delivered to us what has been delivered to us that's why brother paul will say though we or an angel from heaven preach any other thing to you than that which we have preached he said let him be accursed so christianity is built on jesus built on the finished work of christ believers are built on what christ has done that is the right building all right so he begins to talk about building here building believers Verse 13, look at the way brother Paul puts verse 13. Every man's work, all of you in this church, everyone on Facebook, everyone on YouTube and on television, every man's work, not a special group of people, because every man in the church ought to be a minister. Every one of you ought to be built up for ministry. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. When the saints are perfected, they will do the work of ministry. When every one of you is doing the work of ministry, the body of Christ will be edified. I have one assignment to raise ministers out of all of you. To build ministry into every one of you. That's why I labor tirelessly, day and night, to build the ministry into you. To build you up to do ministry. Every one of you, including children, to build every one of you so I can present every of you perfect before the Lord Jesus Christ. So you are built up for ministry. That is why now brother Paul will say in Corinthians where we were, every man's work shall be made manifest. Every man, no exception. For the day shall declare it. 
because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's walk of what sort it is making reference to every believer in verse 13 so the question is what did he mean by every man's walk shall be revealed by fire what did he mean by every man's walk shall be revealed by fire so let the scriptures interpret itself this is similar to what he wrote to the same church in his second letter to them second corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 for we must all every one of us appear before the judgment seat of christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done whether it be good or evil the phrase judgment seat is the greek word bima implies where men approach in order to receive a reward for an accomplishment in this context paul is referring to believers receiving rewards for deeds done in the church for deeds done in the body of christ our service our ministry what we do in the body to edify the body so the word fire that he used in first corinthians 13 was figurative expression of the judgment of the work and labor done by believers that fire is figurative that means all our works will be judged that's what he was communicating all our works will be judged all our labor will be judged in essence he was referring when believers when believers work service labor for the lord will be rewarded when the believers work service labor for the lord will be rewarded please pay attention that's why he said in the same context for the day shall reveal it or declare it it shows that the real issue he was discussing was the judgment and the fire was just a figurative expression used by the author look at it again in first corinthians chapter 3 verse 14 and 15 if any man's work abide which he had built thereupon this is service this is not salvation he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire all right so some will receive a reward and some will not receive a reward so question why did their work not abide why will some people's work not abide why will some people's work be destroyed by the judgment first corinthians 3 10 to 12 according to the grace of god which is given unto me as a wise master builder i have laid the foundation and another builder thereon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon watch this for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is christ jesus now if any man build upon this foundation gold silver precious stones wood hay stubble see the different figures that brother paul used to describe what has been done now watch he built it on a foundation and that foundation has already been laid we are not laying the foundation it's been laid the foundation is a person his name is christ so what determines the quality of work built and the reward received is the foundation all the ministry you're doing is it built on christ or on human efforts the messages you preach are they glorifying the finished work or humanism or motivation or humanistic gospel welfare gospel or the law of moses or morality because none of those is the foundation and our building has to be on the finished work on what christ has done our building of believers has to be on what christ has done so the foundation is what will determine the reward look at verse 15 of the same chapter if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss if your bible was mine i will underline he shall suffer loss now that's not a loss of salvation because in the same sentence he said but he himself shall be saved 
yet so as by fire. So there's a difference between salvation and reward. But there are people that will lose the reward. The loss he suffers is the reward. Why? Because his works are judged. And because his works were judged, the works did not abide. So he suffers loss. So the statement, if any man's work shall be born, cannot be referring to, you know, how physical fire burns objects. The word burned was referring to the judgment of that work. The word burned is not talking about physical fire here. So the revelation, the revelation that it did not abide is because the work was not built on the foundation. Or he did not take heed how he built upon. The revelation was not built on what Christ has done. That's why the works will be burnt. Or he did not take heed how he built on the foundation. Watch verse 12 and see the adjectives brother Paul used. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Look at the adjectives. It was to explain figuratively the status of their works after being judged. So the question is, the man whose work does not abide, or the man whose work is born, shall suffer the loss of what? Because he says he shall suffer loss. So the question is, the loss of what is he going to suffer? To find out what loss will be suffered, we need to find out what exactly is the reward. Because the loss will be simply the lack of reward. The loss that a man will suffer will be simply the lack of reward. And to be able to see that, let's look at the parable of Jesus in Matthew's account. It gives us a lead. Matthew 25 from verse 14 to 27. I'm not going to read this a long read, but you can take note and read at home. The background of the parable is as follows. There was a man who had three servants. Upon his decision to travel to a far country, he called these three servants and gave them talents. One five, one three, one one. But take note of what he said. He gave to each of them according to their ability. According to their ability. Now let's look at Matthew 25, 14 to 15. So we see what he said there. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. Who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Alright? Key phrase here is their ability. Because it implies they were expected to be involved in activities in their master's absence. And the activities that were given to them were given to them within the confine of their abilities. Now look at verse 19 to 28. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reconnect with them. So friends, for ministry, for service, everything we do in this house, everything we do on Facebook as believers, in our campuses, on YouTube, there is a day of reckoning for our ministry, our service, and what we do for Christ. A day of reckoning is surely coming. All of us are going to confront the Bema seat of Christ. The seat of God's judgment for the world. Now, so there's a day of reckoning. That's important. It shows, therefore, that these people's interaction between the masters and the servants after he returned from his journey. So let's see the interactions. In verse 20, first servant, verse 20. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. He has gained first servant. So he used the five talents and gained five. Hence, he was a faithful servant. What was his reward? Verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Clearly, his reward is seen in two things. Number one, the commendation or the words of his faithfulness by his master. That's the first reward. 
the commendation, the words of his faithfulness by his master. Number two, he was given an increase in authority and responsibility. He was given an increase in authority and responsibility. So the reward for the guy that brought five other talents was a commendation. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Those words from the mouth of Jesus. And then secondly, he was given increase as a ruler over much. That means his authority and responsibility increased. So let's look at the second servant, verse 22 of the same chapter. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. Alright? So this guy with two talents given brought two more talents. So he was faithful. Look at his reward in verse 23. His Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful. Not good and powerful. Good and faithful. Not good and charismatic. Good and faithful. I have discovered that sometimes there can be people that are charismatic but they are not faithful. They are not reliable. So the, the yardstick for God's reward is not dynamism. It's faithfulness. Fa That's why the Bible says a faithful man shall abound with blessing. Faithful. Consistently, constantly, constant. Faithful. Well done, thou good and faithful. He says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not good and faithful apostle. Not good and faithful prophet. Not good and faithful reverend doctor. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of of thy lord so the second guy likewise received reward of commendation words of his faithfulness and number two he was given an increase in authority and responsibility the third guy verse 24 and 25 then he which had received the one talent came and said lord i knew thee that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed and I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. He did not use the talent given him by his master. He was unfaithful. This guy was unfaithful. And somebody said, you know, I'm just a floor member in the church. You're just being unfaithful. With all that you're learning, you're still a floor member. Somebody said, you know, I, I, I'm so busy, I don't have time. You know, I don't have time. You, with all you know, you still don't have time. You're just being unfaithful. That's all it is. You're just being unfaithful. You're just being unfaithful. This guy was unfaithful. What was his reward? Verse 26 to 28. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked, if after all you have learned, you are not using it to save people, build up believers, advance the work of God, spread this revelation around the world, get people all over the world to hook up and be built up, you are wicked. You are slothful, servant. Thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest, therefore, to have put my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming, I should have received my own with usury. 28. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which are ten talents. Hmm. So unlike the first two servants, he didn't get good commendations, number one, from his master. No good commendation. Number two, the talent he was given initially was taken from him and given to the first servant. He lacked responsibility. The key lesson in this parable of Jesus is faithfulness with the work committed to a man's trust. Every one of us, the things you are learning here is ministry committed to your trust. That's what I always say to people, a spiritual father or a pastor is one who builds ministry and doctrine into you. A spiritual father is not somebody who got you born again. It is somebody who took the doctrine of the word of God and built it into you 
and pulled out the ministry from you so you can be a blessing to others. That's a spiritual father. And somebody said, well, you know, I watch Dr. Damina. I learned everything from Dr. Damina, but I have a spiritual father. You are mentally agitated. If everything you're learning is from me, then I'm your spiritual father. Your loyalty and your commitment to learning and to growing will be to me because I am your source of spiritual nourishment. I am your spiritual father. Brother Paul will say, you are my children in the faith. I have begotten you by the gospel. He called them my son. Somebody said, but the Bible said, don't call any man a father on the earth. That was Jesus talking parables. Look at the epistles. People were called spiritual children. They were fathers. Timothy was brother Paul's son in the Lord. All right? But anybody that builds ministry and labors to build ministry into you, that's your spiritual father. And you owe that man honor. Honor in every field. Honor in every ramification. They that labor among you, esteem them very highly for their work's sake. And they deserve double salary, double honor. All right, so let's proceed. So this guy, his talent was received from him. He was slothful. He was taken away from him. All right, in this regard, faithfulness with the work of the ministry. Every one of us, that's what God expects. That will be faithful with the work of ministry. Whether it is house fellowship, evangelism, prayer, Whatever it is, we must be faithful. Paul echoed this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of men's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Every man shall have the praise of God. So the reward refers to the praise of God. That is words of commendation. That's the reward for service. The reward for ministry are words of commendation from our God, which is as a result of being faithful in and with the work of ministry. So in 1 Corinthians 3.15, if any man's work shall be born, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. From the analysis we just did, it is evident that, firstly, the reward of service or the reward for the work of ministry by the Lord is for faithfulness. Faithfulness. Therefore, Paul warned that a man must take heed how he builds on the foundation. Sometimes there is a temptation to preach what is popular. There's a temptation to preach what people want to hear so they can gather in their thousands and hundreds of thousands. But that will not pass the test of faithfulness. We don't want to preach what you want to hear. We want to preach the counsel of God. We want to preach Christ to you because the revelation of Jesus is the ultimate message of the scriptures. We don't want to preach what is popular, what will make people happy. No, we have the joy of the Holy Spirit. Our joy is in hearing the word of God. So there is that temptation. Hence Paul warns that a man must take heed how he builds on the foundation. Number two, the reward given to the minister whose work abides and he is faithful and he is good. Faithful and good servant. That is commendable words by the Lord unto him for his faithfulness in the work of the ministry. God will give him commendable words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Number three, there is a word brother Paul used to suffer loss. Anyone that his works are bound, he shall suffer loss. Suffer loss will not be to receive from or to be without. Suffer loss will be to be without the commendable words of the Lord. Which is the result of unfaithfulness. You will not hear those commendations. 
You will not hear the words of Jesus. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. To suffer loss means you won't hear that. That's the first thing. He will not say that to you. Remember brother Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 25. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. Paul explained that this reward is incorruptible. That is, this reward is eternal. So the believer will either receive the reward or suffer loss eternally. He will either receive the eternal reward or suffer the loss of it eternally. In other words, the believer who suffers loss will be without the comments of God. He will be without the commendation or the commendable words of God for his faithfulness in the work of the ministry forever. Forever you will not hear God say anything commendable to you. Never. You will never hear God say, well done. Oh, well done. Good and faithful. No, you will never hear anything from the mouth of the Lord. He will commend other people when it comes to you. You'll be mute. You'll be quiet forever. That's what brother Paul said. He will suffer loss. This explains clearly why Paul used the, the phrases be bond and suffer loss. It is similar to his explanation of the judgment of the disobedient to the gospel of Christ. Look at it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8 to 9. Similar. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So observe that those that don't believe the gospel, he calls it disobedience. They are not saved. They disobey the gospel. Then brother Paul now uses the word everlasting destruction from the presence of our God. Notice the phrase from that from was used twice in the sentence. He first said, they shall receive everlasting destruction. Number one, from the presence of God. Number two, from the glory of his power. From the presence of God, from the glory of his power. The word from was translated from the Greek word apo. It implies away from. That is out of. Out of the presence of God. His glory and power explains that destruction, that the punishment is to be away from God's presence forever. The punishment for unbelief is that a man will be away from God's presence forever. That's the punishment. Now, it's similar to the laws a believer who obeyed the gospel, believed the gospel and is in heaven, but is not rewarded because he was not faithful. He will not hear words of commendation. And he will not have responsibility. He will not hear words of commendation. So, the word destruction was translated from the Greek word olethros. O-L-E-T-H-R-O-S. Which implies a loss or to lose. To lose something. It is the same word brother Paul used in the following text of the Bible. Pay attention to the word destruction. First Thessalonians 5.3 For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travel upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. First Corinthians 5.5 to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Take note of the word destruction. First Timothy 6 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful laws, which drown men in destruction, underline, and perdition. So, what Brother Paul explained about those 
who do not obey the gospel is, number one, they will refuse his presence. Number two, they will refuse the glory of his power. Number one, they will refuse his presence. Anyone that does not believe the gospel has refused God's presence. And number two, they will refuse the glory of his power. Look at 2 Thessalonians 1.8 again before I do some exegesis. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That obey not, that's instructive. So the gospel that has not been obeyed is the power of God. The only ability God has to save is the gospel. So when a man rejects the gospel, he has rejected salvation. And when he rejects salvation, he has rejected God's presence. He has rejected God's glory. Alright? Now, God's power and his presence is to save. God's power and his presence is to save. So when a man rejects God's power and his presence, he cannot be saved. When he rejects God's power, when he rejects the gospel, he has rejected God's power to save him. Now, the rod, the rod will be the absence of God's power to save. That thing we call the wrath of God for unbelief is only going to be, see, when God's presence is withdrawn, what occupies the vacuum is what we call the wrath of God, the absence of God's glory and the absence of God's power. Therefore, the destruction is the absence of his power, glory, and presence. Observe, his power, glory, and presence. The glory and the power and the presence of God does not destroy. The glory and the power and the presence of God does not destroy. It's the absence of it that destroys. When it is absent, destruction takes place. Just like death is the absence of life. Destruction is the absence of God's presence and glory and power. So when you reject the gospel, you reject God's presence, God's glory, God's power. The resultant effect of that absence of God's glory, power, and presence is destruction. See? Destruction. Now, just like God didn't create death, death only took effect when life was absent. Now, two terms, bond and suffer loss. First Corinthians 3.15 If any man's work shall be bond, on the line bond, he shall suffer loss, on the line loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. That bond and suffer loss was to explain the fact that the judgment seat of Christ is for believers. So the believer whose work is born will be without God's commendation eternally. Once your works of ministry are born because you didn't do it predicated on the finished work of Christ, the Bible says you will suffer loss forever, eternally. Therefore, the reward is not material, but God's praise. You know what it is for God to praise you? God's commendation. Words about the believer's faithfulness with the work of the ministry. While the loss of reward is when God has no comment about the believer's work. When God has nothing to say about what you have done. He looks at you. You move away. He looks at another person and he begins to shower words of praise and commendation. And that's why brother Paul said every man should be careful how we build upon. So go back to Revelation 2.5 where we started the journey from. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove the candlestick out of his place except thou repent. The question is what did he mean by I will remove your candlestick? I will remove your candlestick. What did he mean by that? 
Note, the instruction or warning about candlestick was written to only this church at Ephesus. No other church was told that. Now, the word candlestick was translated from the Greek word lunkai, which implies a lampstand. Candlestick, a lampstand. That is, it is not the light. It is the lampstand. Same word used by Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels. See where Jesus uses the same word, lampstand. Matthew 5.15 Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Candlestick. Mark 4.21 And he said unto them, It's a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick. Candlestick. Luke 8.16 no man, when he had lighted a candle, covered it with a vessel or put it under a bed, but set it on a candlestick that they which enter in may see the light. Candlestick. In talking about the candlestick, three things to consider. Number one, the light. Number two, the candle. Number three, the candlestick. See? So there is the light, there is a candle, then there's a candlestick. Now remember what he said in Revelation 2, 5 before I proceed. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. What he will remove is the candlestick. But remember there is light, there is candle and there is candlestick. Three different things. And what he said he will remove is the candlestick only. Not the candle neither the light. He will remove the candlestick. To understand what it means, let us look at it in context how it is used. First of all, there was an instruction as touching the removal of the candlestick. And why he will remove the candlestick is because they have left the first works. The first works. Notice that the first works is different from his statement in verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, This thing said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Two, I know thy works. These works, labor, patience, how thou cannot bear them which are evil, is different from the other one in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. He now explained, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. The first works is different from I know thy works. Now, so he explains this in verse 4 and 5. The first works. The word first is the Greek word protos, which implies foremost. Foremost in time, in place or order of importance. Protos, first. John used the same phrase in 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. He first loved us. The word him is italicized. It implies it was instructed by the translators of the King James. So, we love, it will be the word first loved us. Meaning God first loved us. First John 4 16. And we have known and believed the love that God had to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So the first, first walk is referred to what God did in Christ. First love. First walk. What God did in Christ. Revelation 1 5 will explain it. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. The love of God is expressed in the work of Christ. 
the first works, their first walk or first love is God's love for them. The reality of what God has done for them in Christ. That will be their first walk. That will be their first love. The reality of what God has done for them in Christ. That will be their first walk, their first love. The reality. So listen carefully. When he began to talk to the church at Ephesus, he wasn't dealing with their salvation. He was dealing with works. He was dealing with ministry. Okay? The church at Ephesus. He wasn't saying if you don't repent, you will lose salvation. No, he was talking about reward for their service. He has already commended the church. He said, you, you guys, you have labored. I know your works. You have born. You are patient. You have done this. But the only problem is everything you are doing is not predicated on the finished work of Christ. Repent. Stop preaching humanistic gospel. Stop preaching motivation. Stop preaching secularism. Go back and preach the finished work. That's what they was telling the church in Ephesus. Go back to your first work. Your first work came from his first love. God first loved us. That's the first work of Christ. What he did in his death, what he did in his burial, what he did in his resurrection. It is the preaching of that message. It is laboring to push that message. It is laboring to teach that word. That, that defending the finished work, defending the message of Christ, defending the message of his death, burial, and resurrection in spite of persecution and affliction, in spite of how unpopular we are made to look because we are preaching Christ and him crucified. We are not even caring. We are not even looking at people's faces. We are advancing the work. What Christ suffered for cannot be wasted. He died and died well. He rose and rose well. Bible says when he rose from the dead, he sat down. The work was finished. Legalism says Christ didn't finish it. You have to fast. You have to do something to help Christ finish it. That's, an, that's sacrilege. That's casting an aspersion on the work of Christ. And sometimes the way you hear Christians pray, they pray as if Satan and Jesus are still fighting. We have to give Jesus support fire so he can win. But I have news for you today. Jesus won the devil 2,000 years ago. He did a complete job. And when he rose, he said, All power is given unto me in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. He turned to the born again man. He said, Behold, I give you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the devil. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. We preach Christ and him crucified. We preach, we preach the resurrected Christ. We preach the exalted Christ. We preach the glorified Christ. The believer is not trying to please God. The believer has pleased God in Christ. The believer is not trying to win the devil. The believer won the devil in Christ. The believer is not trying to get anything. Our message is built on what Christ has done, which has been delivered to us by the apostles in the epistles that's what we preach and that's why brother paul kept saying take heed how you build be careful what you're preaching those of you in ministry be careful the kind of ministry you're doing i was talking with a you know a man of god and i said sometimes when i hear preachers preach they preach as if they have forgotten that one day we shall appear before jesus with our works of ministry friends i don't care about popularity i don't care about any of those things i care about only one thing to preach Christ and his finished work. To make all men see. Some will misunderstand us. Some will attack us. But we patiently keep preaching it. Along the line, some of them will see it. Along the road, some of them will wake up to the reality of it. It may not make us popular. Who cares about popularity? As long as I will hear Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Friends, every one of you in this church, every one of you on Facebook, on YouTube, every one of you in our campuses around the world, Get your hands on deck. Let's get in the ministry. Let's get busy saving souls, bringing them to the kingdom, establishing them, and advancing the message of his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, sometimes the way some people talk, you will think that what the devil did in Adam is more powerful than what Christ has done in the new creation. That's sacrilege. What Christ has done in the new man. 
what Christ has done in the born again man is not a refurbishment of Adam. It's not an upgrade of Adam. It's not a renovation of Adam. The born again man is the creation of God in Christ Jesus, the handiwork of God. So when we talk about what Christ has done, we must not let anybody make light of it. It is so great salvation. So great salvation. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. That's the gospel we preach. We preach not about going to meet God. We preach about a God who has come down to man. I close with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. Watch this church. And all things are of God who had reconciled us to himself. By Jesus Christ, glory to God. And had given to all of us that are reconciled. All of us, every one of you in this church. All of us have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Once God reconciled you to himself, the next thing he gives you is the ministry to reconcile others. He has given to all of us, every one of you in this church. Except you choose not to. After all, Noah preached for 120 years. Only eight people received this message. 120 years of ministry. Only eight people. Only eight. Everybody else mocked at him, laughed at him, opposed him, made caricature of him. I hear a man of God was, was, was confronted with my message and he was saying, well, Dr. Damina, hmm, Dr. Damina, hmm, that thing he's preaching is the truth. But you will not get money in that message. There's no money in that message. This is what a man of God was saying about me. I'm not in ministry for welfare. I'm in ministry to save souls. I'm in ministry for the kingdom of God. I'm not looking for money. No. I'm not looking for money in ministry. I'm not. I'm in ministry because of passion to see that what Jesus suffered for is not wasted. And ladies and gentlemen, Wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, there is a ministry of reconciliation in your hand. Whoever you are, whatever you're doing, all you need is for us to build you up in the revelation of Christ. And then you carry out that ministry. Watch this in Corinthians where we're reading right now. It says, God has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Every one of us has been given the word of reconciliation. Every one of us has been committed with the word of reconciliation. In the next service on Wednesday, I'm going to begin to look at what is this candlestick and I'm going to go into the other things that the church in Ephesus was warned about and we shall look at the other six churches. Friends, it's going to be exciting as we uncover the truth about the revelation of Jesus to the seven churches. I'm excited, friends. And if there's somebody who knows that you're in ministry and one of these days you will stand before Jesus to give account for that ministry, I'd like you to jump on your feet and shout glory! Shout glory! And say with me, I am loved by God. I am washed by God. I am made a king and a priest. Now say with me, I am reconciled to God by Jesus Christ. Now say, I have the ministry of reconciliation. Say it again, I have the ministry of reconciliation. Now say with me very loud, I am in ministry. Say it again, I am in ministry. Now say with me, I am taking heed how I build. Say it again, I am taking heed how I build on the foundation, which is the finished work of Christ. Now, let me pray for every one of you in this building because this is heavy. Father, I pray for your people. Men and women, boys and girls across the world, watching by Facebook television, watching by YouTube, all our campuses. Lord, you are raising an army of people that will flood the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, the revelation of Jesus, unveiling the identity of the believer, bringing Jesus to the fore and causing men to see his finished work. I pray today that the zeal of God's house will consume everyone in this building and everyone watching in our campuses and by television and Facebook that the glorious light of Christ will illuminate our hearts. 
that together we shall march out and depopulate hell and populate heaven. Barriers are broken and obstacles. I declare that none shall be slothful here. But everyone here shall be aglow, fervent, on fire to see souls saved and discipled. Ligato marika tolagaya. Jikatonia nangando jekia. Riato balita karata nakula dabara. Riando sikala dabaya. In the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, for answer prayer. And I decree for everyone hearing the sound of my voice. When we stand before you, Jesus, we shall joyfully hear you say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thank you for answer prayer. In Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen in this service. Glory. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service. I know you've been blessed by the word of his grace. Please don't go away. Don't go away. The essence of the teaching of God's word is to build you up, equip you, so you can do the work of ministry. That's the whole essence. Not just to acquire knowledge and see that, but to teach you so you can teach others. Brother Paul says, the things that you have learned of me among many witnesses, the same you commit to others, who shall also commit to others. Two things. Number one, if you don't belong to a Bible teaching church where the message of Christ is taught, where the revelation of Jesus is brought to you, then you either join one of our campuses or you can begin one in your community and become the lighthouse for other believers to assemble around and be fed and be taught the word. And today you want to join either a campus of ours or you want to start a campus. All you need to do is shoot me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com with your details. We shall get in touch with you and we shall walk with you, equip you and train you. And we shall walk you through establishing a campus or being a part of one of our already existing campuses in your locality. Lastly, I've written a number of books to address doctrinal issues and to answer questions that you might have. They're on the screen right now. Today, if you require any of those books, you want to order for them or all of them, or you want to order for our CDs or DVDs, shoot a mail also to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com requesting for the materials and our office will get in touch with you and see how they can work out getting the books to wherever you are around the world. I'm excited that I'm able to be a blessing to you today. Remember, I'm live here on Facebook every morning at 10 a.m. GMT plus 1, 12 noon GMT plus 1, 6 p.m. GMT plus 1, and 10 p.m. GMT plus 1. Many times a day, feeding you, feeding you, feeding you, equipping you because we want you to come to a place of robust understanding of an effective relationship between you and God. Share with other people as you look forward to continuing to be a blessing in your life. And until I see you in the next broadcast, enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen.